or on the bank was his hostility exceeded constitutional limits the consequences were most disastrous to the immediate interest of the country but probably not to its ultimate interests the substitution of pet banks for government deposits led to a great inflation of paper money followed by a general mania for speculation when the bubble burst these banks were unable to redeem their notes in gold and silver and suspended their payments then the stringency of the money market equaled the previous inflation in consequence there were innumerable failures and everything fell in value lands houses and goods such was the general depression and scarcity of money that in many states it was difficult to raise money even to pay necessary taxes i have somewhere read that in one of the western states the sheriff sold at auction a good four-horse wagon for five dollars and fifty cents two horses for four dollars and two cows for two dollars the western farmers were driven to despair such was the general depression that president van buren was compelled in eighteen thirty seven to call in an extra session of congress nor were the difficulties removed until the celebrated bankrupt law was passed in eighteen forty chiefly through the efforts of daniel webster which virtually wiped out all debts of those who chose to avail themselves of the privilege what a contrast was the financial state of the country at that time to what it was when jackson entered upon his administration it is not just to attribute all the commercial disasters which followed the winding up of the old united states bank to general jackson and to the financial schemes of van buren it was the spirit of speculation fostered by the inflation of paper money by irresponsible banks when the great balance wheel was stopped which was the direct cause the indirect causes of commercial disaster however may be attributed to jackson's war on the bank the long fight in congress to secure a recharter of the bank though unsuccessful was dignified and statesmanlike but the ungoverned passions displayed by the removal of deposits resulted in nothing and could have resulted in nothing of advantage to any theory of the bank's management and it would be difficult to say who were most to blame for the foolish and undignified crimination and recrimination which followed the president or the hostile senate it was at any rate a fight in which jackson won but which from the animosities it kindled brought down his gray hairs in sorrow to the grave it gave him a doubtful place in the history of the nation if jackson's hostility to the united states bank was inexpedient and violent and resulted in financial disasters his vigorous efforts to put down nullification were patriotic and called forth the approval and gratitude of the nation this was a real service of immense value and it is probable that no other public man then on the stage could have done this important work so well like all jackson's measures it was summary and decided nullification grew out of the tariffs which congress had imposed the south wanted no productive duties at all indeed it wanted absolute free trade so that planters might obtain the articles which they needed at the smallest possible cost and sell as much cotton and tobacco as they could with the least delay and embarrassment professor sumner argues that southern industries either supported the federal government or paid tribute to the northern manufacturers and that consequently the grievances of the southern states were natural and just that their interests were sacrificed to national interests as the new england interests had been sacrificed to the national interests of the time of the embargo undoubtedly the south had cause of complaint and we cannot wonder at its irritation and opposition to the taxes imposed on all for the protection of american manufactures on the other hand it was a grave question whether the interests of the nation at large should be sacrificed to build up the interests of the south to say nothing of the great moral issues which underlie all material questions in other words in matters of national importance which should rule should the majority yield to the minority or the minority to the majority in accordance with the democratic principles on which this government is founded there is only one reply to the question the majority must rule this is the basal stone of all constitutional government whose disruption would produce revolution and anarchy it is a bitter and humiliating necessity which compels the intellect the wealth the rank and the fashion of england to yield to the small majority in the house of commons in the matter of irish home rule but an irishman's vote is as good as that of the son of an english peer the rule of the majority is the price of political liberty for which enlightened nations are willing to pay henry clay deserves great praise and glory for his persistent efforts at conciliation not only in matters pertaining to the tariff but in the question of slavery to harmonize conflicting interests but calhoun the greatest man whom the south has produced would listen to no concessions foreseeing that the slightest would endanger the institution with which the interests and pride of the southern states were identified at this crisis the country needed a man at the helm whose will was known to be inflexible 
In the session of 1830, on a question concerning the sales of public U.S. lands in the several states, arose the great debate between Colonel R. Y. Hayne of South Carolina and Daniel Webster on the limitations of federal power, and Hayne's declaration of the right of a state to nullify a federal law that was prejudicial to its interests gained him great applause throughout the South. John C. Calhoun, United States Senator from South Carolina, was at the head of this extreme state sovereignty party, and at a banquet celebrating the birthday of Jefferson, January 13, 1830, he proffered the toast, the Union, next to liberty, the most dear, may we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states and distributing equally the benefit and burden of the Union. Jackson, as president and practical chief of the democracy, was of course present at this political banquet. His profound patriotism and keen political instinct sent in danger, and with his usual impulse to go well forward to meet an enemy, he gave, the Federal Union, it must be preserved. This simple declaration was worth more than all the wordy messages and proclamations he ever issued. It not only served notice upon the seceders of his time that they had a great principle to deal with, but it echoed after him and was the call to which the nation victoriously rallied in its supreme struggle with treason thirty years later. Notwithstanding the evident stand taken by the President, the Calhoun Party continued their opposition on state lines to the federal authority. And when Congress passed the tariff of July 1832, the South Carolina legislature in the autumn called a convention which pronounced that act and the Tariff Act of 1828 unconstitutional, null and void, and no law, called on the state legislature to pass laws to prevent the execution of the Federal Revenue Acts, and declared that any attempt at coercion on the part of the federal authorities would be regarded as absolving South Carolina and all its people from further obligation to retain their union with the other states and that they should then forthwith proceed to organize a separate government as a sovereign and independent state. If such a man as Buchanan had then been in the presidential chair, there probably would have been a southern confederacy, and in 1832 it might have been successful. But Jackson was a man of different mold. Democrat and southern sympathizer as he was, he instantly took the most vigorous measures to suppress such a thing in the bud, before there was time to concert measures of disunion among the other southern states. He sent General Scott to Charleston with a body of troops stationed not far away. He ordered two war vessels to the harbor of the misguided and rebellious city. On December 4th, in his annual message, he called the attention of Congress to the opposition to the revenue laws and intimated that he should enforce them. On December 11th, he issued a proclamation to the inhabitants of South Carolina, written by Livingston, moderate in tone, in which it was set forth that the power of one state to annul a law of the United States was incompatible with the existence of the Union and inconsistent with the spirit of the Constitution. Governor Hayne issued a counter-proclamation, while Calhoun resigned the Vice Presidency in order to represent South Carolina on the floor of the Senate. In January, the President sent another message to Congress asking for authority to suppress rebellion. Congress rallied around the executive and a bill was passed, providing for the enforcement of the collection of the customs at Charleston and arming the president with extraordinary powers to see that the dangers were averted. Most of the states passed resolutions against nullification, and there was general approval of the vigorous measures to be enforced if necessary. The nullifiers, unprepared to resist the whole military power of the country, yielded, but with ill grace, to the threatened force. Henry Clay in February introduced a compromise tariff, and on the 27th of that month it was completed, together with an enforcement act. On March 3rd it became a law, and on March 11th the South Carolina nullifiers held an adjourned meeting of their convention and nullified their previous nullification. The triumph of Jackson was complete, and his popularity reached its apex. It is not to be supposed that the collection of duties in southern parts was the only cause of nullification. The deeper cause was not at first avowed. It was the question of slavery, which is too large a topic to be discussed in this connection. It will be treated more fully in a subsequent lecture. An important event took place during the administration of Jackson, which demands our notice, although it can in no way be traced to his influence, and this was the anti-Masonic movement, ending in the formation of a new political party. The beginning of this party was obscure enough. One Morgan in western New York was abducted and murdered for revealing the alleged secrets of Freemasonry. These were in reality of small importance, but Morgan had mortally offended a great secret society of which he was a member by bringing it into public contempt. 
his punishment was greater than his crime which had been not against morality but against a powerful body of men who never did any harm but rather much good in the way of charities the outrage aroused public indignation that a man should be murdered for making innocent revelations of mere ceremonies and pretensions of small moment and as the masons would make no apologies and no efforts to bring the offenders to justice it was inferred by the credulous public that masons were not fit to be entrusted with political office the outrage was seized upon by cunning politicians to make political capital jackson was a mason hence the new party of anti-masons made war against him as they had been his supporters the democratic party of the state of new york was divided the leading democratic leaders had endeavored to suppress this schism but it daily increased founded on the popular ignorance and prejudice until it became formidable in 1830 four years after the murder the anti-masons had held conventions and framed a political platform of principles the chief of which was hostility to all secret societies the party against all reason rapidly spread through new york pennsylvania and new england its stronghold being among the farmers of vermont ambitious politicians soon perceived that a union with this party would favor their interests and men of high position became its leaders in 1831 the party was strong enough to assemble a convention in baltimore to nominate candidates for the presidency and william wirt the great maryland lawyer was nominated not with any hope of election but with the view of dividing the ranks of the democratic party and of strengthening the opposition headed by clay the national republican party which in the next campaign absorbed all the old federalist remnants and became the whig party all opposition to jackson however was to no purpose he was elected for his second term beginning in eighteen thirty three the anti-masonic movement subsided as rapidly as it was created having no well-defined principles to stand upon it has already passed into oblivion i have now presented the principal subjects which made the administrations of jackson memorable there are others of minor importance which could be mentioned like the removal of the indians to remote hunting grounds in the west the west india trade the successful settlement of the spoliation claims against france which threatened to involve the country in war prevented by the arbitration of england similar settlements with denmark spain and naples treaties of commerce with russia and turkey and other matters in which jackson's decided character appeared to the advantage but it is not my purpose to write a complete history of jackson or of his administrations those who want fuller information should read parton's long biography in which almost every subject under the sun is alluded to and yet which in spite of its inartistic and unclassical execution is the best thesaurus i know of for jacksonian materials more recent histories are dissertations in disguise on disputed points here then i bring this lecture to a close with a brief allusion to those things which made up the character of a very remarkable man who did both good and evil in his political career his private life is unusually interesting by no means a model for others to imitate yet showing great energy a wonderful power of will and undoubted honesty of purpose his faults were those which may be traced to an imperfect education excessive prejudices a violent temper and the incense of flatterers which turned his head and of which he was inordinately fond we fail to see him in the modesty which marked washington and most of the succeeding presidents as a young man he fought duels without sufficient provocation he put himself in his military career above the law and in his presidential career above precedents and customs which subjected him to grave animadversion as a general he hanged two respectable foreigners as spies without sufficient evidence he inflicted unnecessary cruelties in order to maintain military discipline wholesome doubtless but such as less arbitrary commanders would have hesitated to do he invaded the territory of a neutral state on the plea of self-defense in his conversation he used expletives not considered in good taste and which might be called swearing without meaning any irreverence to the deity although later in life he seldom used any other oath than by the eternal personally jackson's habits were irreproachable in regard to the pleasures of the table he was temperate almost abstemious he was always religiously inclined and joined the church before he died perhaps however out of loyalty to his wife whom he adored rather than from theological convictions but whatever he deemed his duty he made every sacrifice to perform although fond of power he was easily accessible and he was frank and genial among his intimate friends with great ideas of personal dignity he was unconventional in all his habits and detested useless ceremonies and the etiquette of courts he put a great value on personal friendships and never broke them except under necessity for his enemies he cherished a vindictive wrath as unforgiving as nemesis 
In the White House, Jackson was remarkably hospitable, and he returned to his beloved hermitage poorer than when he left it. He cared little for money, although an excellent manager of his farm. He was high-minded and just in the discharge of debts, and although arbitrary, he was indulgent to his servants. He loved frankness in dealing with advisers, although he was easily imposed upon. While he leaned on the councils of his kitchen cabinet, he rarely summoned a council of constitutional advisers. He parted with one of the ablest and best of his cabinet, who acted from a sense of duty in a matter where he was plainly right. Toward Nicholas Biddle and Henry Clay, he cherished the most inexorable animosity for crossing his path. When we remember his lack of political knowledge, his spoils system, his indifference to internal improvements, his war on the United States Bank, and his arbitrary conduct in general, we feel that Jackson's elevation to the presidency was a mistake and a national misfortune, however popular he was with the masses. Yet he was in accord with his generation. It is singular that this man did nothing to attract national notice until he was forty-five years of age. The fortune of war placed him on a throne, where he reigned as a dictator, so far as his powers would allow. Happily, in his eventful administration, he was impeded by hostile and cynical senators, but this wholesale restraint embittered his life. His great personal popularity continued to the end of his life in 1845, but his influence is felt to this day for both good and evil. His patriotism and his prejudices, his sturdy friendships and his relentless hatreds, his fearless discharge of duty and his obstinacy of self-will, his splendid public services and the vast public ills he inaugurated, will ever make this picturesque old hero a puzzle to moralists. His life was turbulent, and he was glad when the time came to lay down his burden and prepare himself for that dread tribunal before which all mortals will be finally summoned the one tribunal in which he believed and the only one which he was prompt to acknowledge authorities the works written on jackson are very numerous probably the best is the biography written by parton defective as it is professor w e sumner's work in the series of american statesmen is full of interesting and important facts especially in the matters of tariff and finance see also benton's thirty years in the united states senate cobbett's life of jackson Curtis's Life of Webster, Colton's Life and Times of Henry Clay, as well as Carl Schurz on the same subject, Von Holst, Life of Calhoun, Memoir of John Quincy Adams, Tyler's Life of Taney, Sargent's Public Men, The Speeches of Webster, Clay, and Calhoun. End of section 4.